Thank you so much for joining our team this morning. We are the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs, and we know that there might have been some transitions and some changes in your schools, and we just want to be sure that everybody has as much information as possible to be able to uh, engage in the work related to the Federal Emergency Relief Programs. So we're gonna get started with introductions on our team. So you can put a voice with a face and a name and also a funding source in the work that they engage in within our team. We also ask that, you know, we wanna to get to know you folks as well. So if you don't mind putting your name, your email address and your school community in the chat box, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> One housekeeping item is that this training is being recorded so we will have it available on our website so if you happen to have a colleague or engage in a conversation with another district who may have a new applicant coordinator or business manager please encourage them to visit our website in about a week and a half we will have that posted my name is shelly chassis jandro i'm the director of the office of federal emergency relief programs and I come to this work through ESEA federal programs. I was the Title II program coordinator. Good morning, I'm Monique Sullivan and I am the ARP ESSER III coordinator. And I also um, assist with the ARP HCY, um, the homeless um, uh, part of money that comes with the ARP funding. Good morning, I'm Karen Kuziak. I coordinate the CARES and CARISA or CIRSA funds some of you may know these as easter one and easter two if, if you talk about them in your uh, school districts the cares program is ending at the end of this month so that i'll just drop that and if you if you if that's new information for you please be in touch with us we also are joined by kevin harrington uh, he is out putting a child on the school bus but kevin supports our non-publics in particular as the GEAR and EANS coordinator, emergency assistance for non-public schools. I am Maisha Asha, I am the fiscal coordinator and I uh, manage the reimbursement side of all of these funds, CARES, CARSA and ARP. I'm Robert Palmer, I'm the procurement analyst. I work with Kevin on with the EANS funds. Good morning, I'm Deanna Roberts. Uh, I'm a management analyst and I work on the reimbursement side. I do invoicing for CARES ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 ARP and other duties as assigned. We also have Rebecca Mitchell, who is another management analyst on our team who does similar work to Deanna. So really reviewing invoices and reimbursement requests from our SAUs. I'm Terry Beal. I'm a contracted invoice reviewer, and I'm reviewing those invoices that are being submitted for reimbursement. So we have lots of information and lots of slides, but the, the purpose of uh, today's meeting kind of comes down to these, this, these uh, slug lines, I guess, uh, that are on this slide. We're going to be giving introductions to the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Program. That's just what we did. We're gonna be talking particularly primarily about the ESSER funding and providing an overview of that. Uh, and also discuss and try to underscore and reinforce the programmatic as well as the financial implications of the ESSER funding. And we hope by the end of this uh, long session, <laughs> you'll understand the application process through all the way through the reimbursement process if those are responsibilities that you have in your positions now. Identify who to contact for questions, then I, I probably that's the key piece right there is we, we are here to help you and our con contact information is going to come up on the slide and you will be able to access a copy of all of these slides and locate resources for support. We do have a pretty thorough, thoroughly archived uh, list of resources and previous office hours um, on our website that you'll have access to. So one thing, the Fred off is every Thursday, uh, the first of Thursday of the month at nine o'clock, we have an office hour that's, uh, that's via Zoom for any folks who are interested in tuning in. Those are recorded and the slides are available after the meeting. 
<clears throat> we tend not to meet during the summer months. And there's one registration link that's listed there that you can uh, assign yourself up for all of the um, September through June meetings. So we're going to break the slides into sections or parts. And right now we're in the part, we're going to start the part that is for federal emergency relief, the very overview, the big picture. For public schools, there are three funding streams. The CARES Act, which was passed in March, right when the pandemic started, March 27th, 2020. Then that <coughs> later in the at the end of that year of 2020, Carissa came through with a larger amount of money, but it's still proportional to whatever you got in CARES. You've got like two and a half times that, as I remember, in Carissa. And then very, very much more, I think four times as much, I could have the ratios off for ARP, but the ARP funding is the largest one. And it had a few more restrictions associated with it, which you will hear about uh, as we move ahead here. But you can see the amount of money that came in, if you look at the spotlight, that came into Maine for Maine school districts to use. And again, it was proportioned out according to uh, low income counts in the uh, SAUs or school districts based on 2019 figures. I think this is mine. Also, uh, for ESSER spending, primarily there were um, these points that we need to think about um, when you're using these funds. The funds are designed to prevent, prepare for, or respond to the COVID pandemic. So almost every use that, uh, every, yes, every use that you ask for or seek reimbursement for has to be related to the pandemic. Uh, does the use of funds fall under one of the authorized uses of funds? Uh, I think what that is talking about is the funds can be used for uh, the same sorts of things that you use uh, CTE funding, IDEA money, uh, funding for Title I funding for. Uh, you must follow the uniform administrative requirement, cost principles, and audit requirements for federal uh, awards. So all of the policies and procedures that you have in place that your school district has to have in place, and if you don't know about them now, locate them or have someone in your office locate them for you. Those cost principles about the kinds of things that are permitted or not, like when can meals be permitted or, or you know, what are the restrictions, what are the very heavy restrictions on things like meals or gift cards, all of those principles have to be in place <clears throat> and apply to the use of the ESSER funds. Um, and they must be spent uh, not at the whim of someone in the central office. Oh, I have an idea about how to spend this money, but there should be, or there must be, it's required to be stakeholder engagement. So talking with the community, talking with your board, talking with a variety of folks from all of the schools in the district to come up with what the most important uh, and significant needs are for your school community has always been a part of the um, ESSER funding requirement <clears throat> even more so in the ARP um, largest funding stream. So Shelley, I think I have the next slide, but if, I just wanted you to go back for just a second. Um, so I just wanted to stress that, um, especially if you're, we understand that it's been two years of the pandemic, um, as we get further and further away from the emergency of the pandemic, and you start revising projects or realizing that you need to make some changes, these four bullets are something that you need to be aware of every time you're making changes to your application. Um, does it prepare, pre you know, uh, prevent, prepare for, and respond to? I know that COVID seems like a fire, but it all still needs to be related to that. So what I uh, counsel district or districts to do or advise them is you may be looking more toward responding versus preventing and preparing for. Um, also, the authorized uses, even though it may prepare for and respond to COVID, is it on one of those allowable uses? So make sure you check those out. All of those are in the application itself. Um, and then again, the meaningful stakeholder consultation. I know we have a lot of change in, in leadership. A lot of superintendents are, come, are, are coming in new to districts and they may want to come up with, oh, we're going to do this new project make sure that they go through these four bullets um, before they start making changes to, uh, to your applications. 
Um, and it is a large amount of money, as Karen pointed out in um, a previous slide, um, over 600 million. I can't now, I'm like, too, seems like too much money now, but it is a lot of money. Um, and as you probably already know, the ESSER allocations were done proportionally based on Title I allocations. Um, and we just had a real quick, the highest district in the state um, with all the funds received um, 31 million. And then the average to about 3 billion and the lowest about 9,000, about you know, almost uh, 10,000. Um, they are considered to be very high risk funds. Um, and you'll find out why it's because they have a lot of similar allowable uses, which means you have a ton of flexibility to meet identified needs. Um, there's no supplement, supplement versus supplant provision. Um, so especially for those of us coming from the ESCA world, this was kind of a like, whoa, like, a, you know, a little bit of mind blowing for us. Um, but keep in mind that you that districts are still responsible for maintaining um, maintenance of effort and maintenance of, of equity. We actually did a separate webinar last week on maintenance of equity. So if that applies to your district, um, we recommend that you go and watch that. Um, and then uh, it has a very short period of availability, as Karen mentioned, the first uh, portion of the funds, uh, the CARES ESSER 1, is ex actually is expiring in about two weeks. Um, and then it'll follow up with the um, in previous years. And again, we just stress really that it's very vulnerable to fraud, waste, and abuse and mismanagement or need transformation. And the need transformation addresses like two years ago, you might have said this was a need. And now you say this is a need, and then in a month you, your needs might change. And with that comes a lot of um, just a little bit more level of scrutiny and how those funds are being used. And then the ARP Homeless Children and Youth. Uh, this is a separate um, portion of the ARP Act that put money aside for um, homeless students or homeless children or children experiencing. Um, homelessness. Um, it was awarded again on a SAU um, to SAUs through a formula, and you had to meet um, the threshold of 5,000. So some districts did not receive this additional funding, and some of them did. Um, about 75 districts did. And then again, you need to identify your homeless children and youth. Um, you have to, you can provide wraparound services, but it also needs to address COVID, um, prepare for, prevent, or respond to COVID. And the main focus of this money is really to lessen the barriers for these students experiencing homelessness to have access to their education. So that's the that's kind of the, the filter that I use when I read applications. Um, how are these going to less what what resources, what programs are districts using to lessen the barriers for homeless students experiencing homelessness to access their education? So here is some timeline for our grants. So for CARES ESER 1, the funds needs to be ob obligated by September 30th, 2022, which is a uh, little bit more than two weeks from now. And uh, you can submit the reimbursement request until December 30th, 2022. For K K CARSA ESER 2, um, the obligation date is September 30th, 2022. 23, and you can su submit your reimbursement request till December 30, 2023. And for ARP, uh, our obligation date is September 30, 2024, and uh, you can reimbur request us for reimbursement till December 30, 2024. So in the next few slides, we will see what obligation means and what is uh, uh, the what is meant by the reimbursement? I mean, the, uh, uh, if you can go, go to the next slide, we, we can, uh, yeah, the obligation date and the liquidation date. So the obligation date is all the expenses needs to be made by September 30th, 2022 for ESR 1 grants. And you can submit your invoices for reimbursement to us till December 30th, 2022. So as per our uniform guidance uh, to CFR 200.171, we, 
when used in connection with a non-federal entity's utilization of funds under a federal award. Obligation means orders placed for property and services, contracts and sub awards made and similar transaction during a given period that require payment by the non-federal entity during the same or a future period. So for uh, ESR 1, the obligation period is September 30th, 2022. For uh, as per 2 CFR 200.343B, uh, uh, liquidation means the drawing down and expenditure of funds by grantee for obligation incurred during the grant's legal obligation period. Timely liquidation occurs during the legal obligation period and through the first 120 day, 20 days after the final day of that period or an extension of the period by U.S. Department of Education. So for ESR 1 grant, you can you have the time till December 30th, 2022 for this liquidation time. So you can request your re reimbursement request and we need to process the time. So all together, we will have 120 days after the obligation date. So can we please go to the next slide? So in this uh, slide, uh, uh, there are some examples depending on type of property and services when the obligation is made. So uh, I would just um, uh, stress some of it. So uh, for acquisition of real or personal property, the obligation will be on the date on which the state or subgrantee makes a binding written commitment to acquire the property. That will be the obligation date. For example, travel, for traveling, the obligation date will be when the travel is taken. For rental of real or uh, personal property will be when the state or sub uses the property. So here are just some uh, guidance when uh, and um, when we, uh, uh, we can consider the date as an obligation date. So say for example, all the services that you are planning uh, the, to uh, invoice us under ESR 1, that needs to be done or completed within th September 30th, 2022. Then you can request us reimbursement for those expenses till December 30th, 2022. Next slide, slide please. So now we're going to get into sort of the meat of our work, and that's essentially <laughs> the applications. So there is going to be an application for CARES, Carissa, ARP, and ARP HCY. So we just wanted to give you the location in which all of that information is housed, as well as the portal in which a reimbursement request can be made. So an, a submission of invoice documentation is all done within our mm. federal grant reimbursement system. And that is located at 4pcamain.org. And you can see on the left-hand bar, all of our applications reside there. And then once you click onto this public domain, which is that heading website, you'll get into a location where you are required to have a username or a login and a PIN. All of this information on the right-hand side is established per district. So keeping in mind, if you're coming in, there is already a username and password developed for your district. And we're gonna talk about some ways in which you can be sure that you can receive a new login and password should you be transitioning within your role. So there are some step-by-step -step directions available on our website. A couple things that you want to note particularly is you are going to do this change, this new login and password change in the federal grant reimbursement system. You may also have to do additional changes based on the fact that you may have uh, had a new superintendent within your district or you may have a new business manager. But the one stop, the first stop that you want to be sure that you're engaging in is that federal grant reimbursement system. 
And that system talks to the applications as well. So you, my apologies, you will go in and you will be sure that you change the account email and then the, the account login and write down your password because that is computer system generated. <laughs> so it will be a combination of capitals, lowercases and numbers and it's unique to you. So it's not a, not a, none of this information is maintained within our team. So I know Barb's got a question. So I'm gonna pause for just a moment. Am I good to ask Shelly? Yes. Okay. So, um, as you know, we've, we've done in EUT all of our applications and all of those things. Is this pertinent to, to me uh, uh, for the EUT applications or is this for people who've not done any of this so far? So it's pertinent if you've had any sort of change within your, your local level. So if you have received a new superintendent or are a new applicant coordinator or have a new business manager, it's applicable to anybody who's seen any change in any, excuse me, any of those roles. Okay. So moving forward in this training, if 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 I'm good and have no and have no changes that I need to address, do I is this all relevant to me? Is there going to be new information that I need to know? Nope. This is a training for our new applicant and business managers. All right. Well, it was good to see you. Same here. <laughs> have a wonderful week. You too. Thank you. So as I mentioned, it's twofold, right? You're gonna do that new username and password, new login and password on the federal grant reimbursement system. And then you may have had some changes like um, your superintendent has shifted. You will go into each of those applications and within each of those applications, you can update the new coordinator's contact information as well as the superintendent information. Both of those entities can be updated right on the application setup page, whether it's in CARES, CARISA, or ARP, either one, two, or three. Same sort of denotion in regards to where to do this item. You'll see that we highlighted the top section on the right-hand side, which is the superintendent information. That's important because the superintendent and the LEA contact, which is highlighted on the bottom right-hand side of that image, are the two individuals that when we send notifications in GEMS, we'll receive that notification. So you may be thinking, well, gosh, I didn't get the, the email about this training today. Hmm, I wonder why that is. That is very likely that your email address is not within any one of the applications. Particularly, we sent this notice out in our ARP portal. So if you are the new applicant coordinator, you have a new superintendent or a new business manager, you wanna be sure that you're doing this through each application as well as through the federal grant reimbursement system. Because again, if we go in as a team and we tend to use our ARP portal more often for notifications because it is the recent funding package, um, we go in and we, send in, we have the capabilities of sending an email to both of those entities, the superintendent and the LEA, which we also refer to as the applicant coordinator. <laughs> so we did have a specific training related to ARP and the application for ARP. So I wanted to call your attention to that training, which is available on our website. They sort of start around July 14th, but we had multiple of them. So if you find yourself working on the ARP application in particular and have a question, I would encourage you to visit this resource. As Karen stated at the top of the hour, we do have a number of resources available on our website, and those um, are on sort of a, a quick screenshot on the left-hand side. That's just a portion of the resources that we have available. So we get a lot of questions about um, how long is the review process and how long is the entire process itself. Um, and the application um, review is about two to three weeks. Um, and the three things that we look at for any of the applications, CARES, well, CARES isn't gonna be for much longer, uh, but um, Carissa Esther 2 and ARP Esther 3 is, does it prepare for, 
do the projects prepare for, prevent, or respond to, to the pandemic? Um, is it an allowable expense per federal statute? And is it, it's evaluated for necessity. Um, we also look at it for reasonableness as well. Um, for example, if your new superintendent wants to put in a swimming pool, uh, we're probably going to review that and say, how's that related to COVID? And I'm being sarcastic, but is it, a, is it allowable use? And is it reasonable and necessary? Um, it usually takes about two or three weeks, depending on the number of applications in the queue and also the complexity. We have some districts that have four projects. And we have some districts that have 50 projects. So that can also determine how long it'll take to review an application. Um, then it goes, we look at the project expense. Um, SEU conduct, they conduct the approved project. The expense is generated and an SAU processes the payment. And then it goes into the reimbursement part of the, of the phase of this. And that is um, you, the SAU requests uh, reimbursement they provide documentation and that process can go anywhere between 17 and 45 days because this process also not only involves um, our invoicers on the fiscal side for us approving, reviewing and approving the invoice, then it goes on to um, the state that um, it's called DAFs, I can never remember, but it's like our, our big state accountant and they review it and make sure that it is um, allowable and meets all the guidelines and then they'll send out um, the reimbursement either through a real check, if that's the method that your district uses, or it'll be automatically deposited, um, whichever way your district um, receives reimbursement from the state. And then the next, this is just something to think about, especially now that we're two years into this, um, using these ESSER funds. And that is, think about this as a progress monitoring um, as, the school, as the new school year begins, Now's the time to look at what um, past ESSER objectives had been, the learning outcomes related to those ESSER funded activities, and has it been impactful? Has this, um, these programs being funded with ESSER, has it had the impact that it was intended? Um, looking at the data, revising as necessary, and then continuing on with funding those projects with ESSER funds to prepare for, prevent, or respond to COVID. All right, so I'm imagining that many of you are new to your position and you're wondering, oh gosh, what has our district been doing so far with these funds? There is a way that you can download a PDF of the current status of your application so that you can see what is written in there, what the district, you know, as of the last date of the revision of the application, what they were intending to use the funds for. So we encourage you to do that so that you can understand the projects. And uh, there is also a place, read carefully the text that um, discusses where, how um, it was determined that these were the priorities for your district and what the identified needs are. So the circles are places where you can download um, information about each of the funds. And, one of the things that we've noticed, and it's, it's not surprising because so many things are going on in school districts, I, I know that, um, having worked in one, um, but it's very important for people on the program side who are having ideas and raising ideas about how to use this money or are enacting the ideas, this is ideal, they're enacting the ideas that the community stakeholders have said, these are our priorities. So someone has an idea for how to use the money, the business side also needs to know that. And you know, so there should be regular communication between the programmatic side and the business side or the financial side about how these funds are being used and where you are. So we're, we're um, recommending at least four times a year to, to actually sit down and discuss the changes that may affect invoicing and the application. Uh, and then number two, align expenses on a trial balance. So if you're on the financial side, you know what the trial balance is and other documentation to, for the projects in the invoice. So uh, the financial side knows that all the receipts and uh, invoices need to be saved, documented, oftentimes uploaded along with the trial balance. Uh, three, determine the object codes with expenses in the approved project. So is it uh, whatever the programmatic side 
purchased or wants to purchase, is that a purchase service or is it a supply or is it a piece of equipment or is it personnel? It all, it all matters. The money has to be divided up uh, accurately according to what's going on in the project, has to be coded accurately financially. Four, discuss the expenses that are needed to be budgeted in the application. So if there have been revisions based on changing needs, discuss that uh, with the person. And uh, number five, identify projects that need to be adjusted, right, based on changing needs. So the, if adjustments are being made, both sides of the operation need to know what's going on. So now we go into um, the physical matters of how we do this. A reimbursement request um, should be processed monthly if at all possible. That would be ideal, but cannot span for more than three months at a time. Um, reimbursement requests cannot span different physical years, July to June. Will not be processed with an unapproved and or opened application. Um, please note that re reimbursement requests should not be deleted once the invoice has been created. Just add something new if you're going to need to do that. Um, next, there we go. Invoicing practices, requirements to attach some supporting documents in the Federal Grant Reimbursement System, GEMS. The file needs to be converted to PDF prior to being attached to the application to the invoice. The file size should be less or equal to 5 MB. The file name should not contain any spaces or any special characters. The special characters always get some, um, they try to put it through and, and, and can't get it through and easy fix. But if you don't, you're not aware of that, that would be hard. I use those in everything I do. So I'm, I'm assuming many people do. So those cannot, um, be used in this. So uh, there, it is very important that the reim there is alignment in between the invoice that you are requesting us for reimbursement and the application that you have submitted. So uh, I, we will uh, rec we recommend and uh, highly encourage you to share the a copy of your ESA application with the business managers because the application has all the uh, budget amount as well as the description what you uh, submitted and approved for. So it will be helpful and beneficial for the business managers to know what can be invoiced as and what the amount is, what the you know dollar amount is that can be uh, uh, re can be reimbursed for. So uh, here is an uh, example of like uh, ESR application where we just, we always try to, uh, when our re uh, review team review the invoice that you submitted, we always map between the invoice and the application at the end. So, uh, so the uh, main point is, yeah, we do we do align budget and the application, and we recommend you to aware to be aware of that and have a copy of the application uh, when you are invoicing us. Next slide, slide please. So in this slide, we wanted to uh, share this link which is um, for uh, financial accounting handbook link, which is available on school finance. Uh, team's uh, website. So if you need any object code, like um, revenue code or uh, fund code, all the codes are there by uh, equipment and services and various types of products, you will find it uh, there. So, and here is the link. So we wanted to just tell you a little bit about some of these categories. So purchase service, Purchase professional and technical services. Um, that would be services that by their nature can be performed only by persons or firms with specialized skills and knowledge. Although a product may or may not result from, a, from the transaction, the primary reason for the purchase is the service provided. Services provide, 
services purchased from another school administrative unit should be coded to a object 5900 series. General supplies, amounts paid for items that are consumed or are worn out or have deteriorated through use of items that lose their identity through fabrication or incorporation into different or more complex units or substances. Equipment. Now equipment is tangible personal property with a useful life of more than a, a year or more and has an acquisition cost of $5,000 or more per unit or is considered highly walkable. Highly walkable items include, but are not limited to computers, laptops, iPads, PDAs, audio, visual equipment, television, DVD players, printers, copiers, cameras, hand tools, cell phones, and et cetera. So this, and I have to go to my other, I can't read some of it, it's too small. Um, so this just gives you a comparable, um, you can look and see equipment versus supplies. Um, and there's just, is more than just the 500, um, excuse me, $5,000 threshold. So it's just giving you a comparison and you can go through and, and for instance, last more than one year, answer yes or no. We'll give you an idea of what, um, what these are and, and how they're comparable. So in equipment, let me get back here. An equipment item is an instrumental machine, apparatus, or set of articles that meets all the following criteria. It remains the its original shape, appearance, and character with use. It does lose, it does not lose its identity through fabrication or incorporation into a different or more complex unit or substance. It is non- expendable that is that is if the item is damaged or some of the parts are lost or worn out it is more feasible to repair the item than replace it with an entirely new unit under normal under normal conditions of use including reasonable care and maintenance it can be expected to serve its purpose its principal purpose for at least a year and here is another link where you could go to and um, look at that a little further. Um, okay. Okay, so in these slides, we will see some invoicing instructions. So, so far for the reimbursement side, you know what are the equipment services, you know the codes, going through the fiscal uh, financial handbook, you know, all the object course that you need to use. So now it's the time to uh, go to the gym and submit your reimbursement request to us. So for that step, uh, we need, we have some requirements when you are submitting your invoice request to us. So for CARES and CURSA, we would require you to submit a detailed trial balance and the trial balance has the date, which needs to be matched with the billing period of your invoice. And the invoice list for CARES and CARSA are optional. Uh, uh, so it will list all the expenses that you are invoicing us with their vendor and you know, amount. So we will see in a bit in the next slide how it looks like. So for the main, there are some differences in the requirement in between CARES and CARSA and ARP because ARP is more detailed. We need more detailed uh, uh, documents. Like we need a detailed trial balance, but on the top of that, we need copies of all receipts and POs for all the services and uh, purchase services and uh, supplies. And uh, we would highly recommend, please write down the project and category name on each of those invoices. That will be very helpful to us because we map all those receipts with the trial balance and we map trial balance expenses 
with what you are invoicing us. So it will be very, very beneficial if you put the description like project and category on each of those cat um, receipts. And on the top of that, it is mandatory for ARP uh, uh, you provide us an invoice list. So list of invoices by project and category. So if we uh, if you uh, can go to the next slide, we can see how it looks like. So uh, here in this slide, you can see by category is student support. And, you know, you can list all the vendors that you are submitting the expenses for that particular billing period. You can you may put accounting code or not. I mean, it's up to you. A little description would be very beneficial and the amount. So it will be very um, uh, helpful for our reviewers when we review your invoice and it will, uh, uh, it will uh, you know, uh, reduce the time of reviewing the invoice uh, for our uh, reviewers. Okay, so um, here is the timeline for uh, our reimbursement process. So uh, for we need five to 10 business days for our team for initial review of the invoices. So uh, it, it used to be a little bit um, more, uh, you know, three, four months ago, but with the, uh, addition of our new team members. And uh, I mean, they have been doing a great job and we are um, able to uh, stick to this timeline. So if you have submitted your request, invoice request, reimbursement request with all the required documentation, so it shouldn't take more than 10 business days for us to review uh, your invoice and next step is to, it will go to the DAFs, which is our Department of Administrative and, uh, uh, and uh, Financial Services. So which is account, state accounting in a nutshell. So they will take seven to 25 business days to process their uh, the payment for those invoices. And after, their process is done, it will take additional 10, three to 10 business days for reimbursement checks to be mailed. So if you are set to get like a direct, uh, direct payment, so it might take little less than 45, total 45 business days. So in total, it takes generally 15 to 45 business days to complete uh, the reimbursement process and get the uh, reimbursement. So we're gonna jump into some other important information yeah. that Monique's gonna chat about. So this is, this is just kind of a reminder. Um, I know I said it before, but as we move further and further away from the pandemic, some um, there might be some confusion or thinking that you don't have to still do a couple of the things that are outlined in the statute. And for the uh, American Rescue Plan or ARPS or three, there is a requirement that on a district's URL or their, on their URL or their, um, their district website, they have to post two plans. They have to post the SAU Safe Return In-Person Instruction Plan, and they need to post their use of ARP ESSER Fund Plan. Now, um, a lot of districts are thinking, oh, we're in person, we don't need the Returned In-Person Plan, or um, our use of funds plan, it still needs to be on the website. And um, I've had questions about, well, we don't even have a masking policy. Well, in the application, it clearly states what the in-person instruction plan needs to have. And for example, it, it needs to follow CDC guidance. So if your CDC, if the CDC now is saying that you don't need to, um, you don't need to quarantine or you don't need to uh, socially distance or physically distance and you don't need masks, then that's what your policy would be. But you still need to have that policy. Um, and then the use of funds plan, it oftentimes gets a little bit confused with the application. Technically, it's not the same. You have your application that you apply for funds, and then you talk about how you're going to use your ARP funds. Most districts or many districts, um, I don't say most, but there are some districts who take their ARP application, they download it as a PDF, 
and then they upload that to their uh, district website. There are some districts that summarize it and they, they, just, they just talk about in summary about how they're using their ARP funds and how it aligns with their meaningful stakeholder consultation. Now, for those of you who may not know what that is, that is also talked about or uh, mentioned in our ARP application. It tells you which stakeholder groups are required um, that you have to have meaningful consultation. And then the other piece that's really important about this is that um, the guidance requires that both plans be reviewed every six months. So a part of our check and balance is that we will go in and check to make sure that the plans that are posted on an SEU's website um, not only meet the minimum requirements for those plans, but that they also have been reviewed in the last six months. So what we recommend is that on your plans that are posted publicly on your website, that you have a date of review. You don't have to update or revise or change either plan, but you do need to review them every six months. So we recommend putting a review date on there. Um, and again, what you have posted on the, for the use of funds plan needs to align with what is in your application. But there's a lot of changes. I mean, on a daily basis, I am probably reviewing four to five applications that have already been approved and they're making changes. So whatever changes happen in the application, they need to reflect be reflected in the use of funds plan on the district's website. Oh, and there's one more thing. The US Department of Education is doing spot checks um, and they are very good at letting us know which districts do not have plans either uploaded to their or available on their website or they're not up to date. And then the last, uh, the maintenance of equity, I mentioned it earlier. I'm just going to go real quickly through this because we actually do have a separate webinar that we did last week. Uh, basically, this is a new set of requirements um, with the ARP that you have to have fiscal and staffing equity um, and that uh, district has to ensure that they are meeting the MO equity requirement um, for their funding. Um, and it was, it's for FY22 and FY23. There's a fiscal component where a district cannot reduce per pupil funding in any high poverty school by any amount that exceeds the per funding reduction in all schools. And if that sounds like Greek to you, highly recommend you watch our webinar that we did last week, or you can reach out to us for some um, individual technical assistance. So that's the physical part, but then you also have a staffing requirement. So you can't reduce the per pupil full-time equivalent or FTE. It has to be at the same rate as if you reduced it for the entire district. Um, and so you have a fiscal and a staffing requirement. Uh, again, though, if you have a lot of questions, just reach out to us. So I can take this one. Um, okay. so we, just, we, <laughs> we wanted just to kind of highlight that, you know, we talked a lot about the application. We talked a lot about the reimbursement requests. Um, however, there is this component, a couple components that we really haven't drawn any attention to. One of them being the performance report. So we had a performance report for the first year of this funding that was due back in March. It is likely, it is guaranteed that we will have another performance report at some point. We haven't yet determined that timeline because the U.S. Department of Education is still reviewing and analyzing all of the data that the SEAs, so the state agencies, submitted on behalf of our LEAs, our SAUs, uh, based on the information that was submitted in the performance report. And we just wanna be sure that if the department, meaning the US Department of Education, makes any changes in their performance report, that we can gather that information for you folks, because it's critical that we're telling an accurate reflective picture of what is transpiring in our state and in our local levels. So these are just the statutes related to those reporting requirements. We also have not highlighted in, in this hour at this point, anything related to monitoring. But monitoring is essentially one of those statutory requirements that requires the state agencies, the SEA, Maine Department of Education, to engage in some checks and balances of funding, of programmatic, of goals. There's a number of different items that are required. 
And you'll, as the applicant coordinator and the lead within this work, you, we will be reaching out to you when the time is applicable for those matters. We also wanted to leave you folks with a few resources. So one of them being our website, which uh, thanks to Rob is now in our chat box. We also have uh, some US Department of Ed resources here on the resource page. Again, this resource page will be available to you folks um, once the PowerPoint is posted on our website in the next couple days. Rob also posted the link to GEMS, which is the portal that we've been talking a whole lot about, as well as the registration link for our monthly office hours that we hold on Thursday. We wanted to leave you folks with our contact information. We talked about briefly at the top of the hour during our introductions of who we are and how we support the work in which all of our federal emergency relief funds are under. However, if you have a question related to ARP, you'd reach out to Monique, CARES, Carissa. CRF has sunsetted at this, well, 15 more days, but for the most part, CRF has sunsetted for um, our package, but you'd reach out to Karen. If you're a non-public school, you'd reach out to Kevin. Anything related to fiscal matters in particular, you'd reach out to Maisha, Didi, Deanna, Rebecca or Terry, depending on who potentially reopened your invoice. And if there's anything that our non-publics have questions about in regards to the procurement of their goods and services, they'd reach out to Rob. So what I'm gonna do is, I know we left a few minutes for questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just kind of open it up to the floor. We completely understand that at this point that probably feels like a whole lot of overwhelming information, but I think the key takeaway is that we're here to support you. So if you have a question, we can respond to them now, um, but also you have our contact information in that PowerPoint to reach out to us individually as well. 